Good morning, friends. It's good to see all of you here at our service of worship today. Let me welcome you with these words. It is written that God called the creation good. It is also written that God sent the Son into the world, not to judge it, but to save it. And the Son said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What is written informs this hour of worship. Therefore, my friends, rejoice, for we are gathered in the redemptive presence of God. Now let those who are able rise and let us sing together our opening hymn, number 332, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Friends, none of us is perfect, and because that is the case, we uh, turn our thoughts to God in a time of confession. Let us uh, responsively read together the prayer of confession. I am L, leader, and you are P, the people of God. Jesus embodied the unconditional love of God. Jesus fed those who were hungry. May our compassion lead us to do likewise. 
Jesus drew near to those living on the margins, those who are often excluded in their society. May we, like Jesus, be more open to others. Jesus brought healing and wholeness to those in need. May we bring healing and wholeness to others as best we are able. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Amen, indeed. Friends, the good news of the gospel is this, that God does not wish to hold anything against any of God's children and is more than ready to forgive those who are truly repentant. And as the psalmist reminds us, God removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. Truly, this is the good news of the gospel. In response to this good news, I invite those who are able to rise and let us sing together the Gloria Patri. <laughs> As we come to this time of the reading of our scriptures, I would invite us to unite our hearts in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that your spirit will be with us and that you will open our hearts and our minds to all it is that the Apostle John has to say to us. And as we listen to his words, may we be drawn into a deeper relationship with our Savior Jesus. In his name we pray it. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading this day comes from the first letter of John, from chapter 3. I'll begin reading at the first verse. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin, sin has either seen him or known him. My dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Here ends our reading from John's first letter. May the Spirit of God be with us as we seek to understand and apply the truths of this passage to our own spiritual lives. Amen.
You have no idea how many tears I shed in the writing of a sermon like today's. But it's true. And in the midst of my preaching, if I begin to sniffle a little bit or wipe my cheeks, you know what's going on. It's a personal thing with me. And I just want you to know that as I work with these sermons, I'm very much aware of the presence of God's Spirit, and I respond to it. And I hope that you do too as I share my thoughts with you today and every Sunday. So on to our sermon for today. The man who wrote the letter from which our scripture verses are taken today is also the disciple who wrote the Gospel of John. You may recall that this John, along with his brother James, was a fisherman. And when Jesus walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and called to John and James, the sons of Zebedee, they responded. Little did John know at that time what, what a ride he was in for. Think about some of the experiences that John observed firsthand. He was there at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee when Jesus changed the water into wine. Oh, and he probably overheard the wine steward remark to the bridegroom, you have saved the best to last. John either overheard the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, or he heard Jesus later relate what was said on that occasion. While John and the other disciples were in town, when Jesus talked with the woman at the well, he was there when she returned along with all of the villagers and heard her telling everyone that this Jesus was the expected one, the Messiah. He was there when Jesus cured the invalid at the pool called Bethesda. He was there when Jesus fed a crowd of over 5,000 with what a, a, a young lad offered, merely five small barley loaves and two small fish. He was there and watched Jesus walk on the water. He was there when Jesus cured the man who had been born blind and he also heard the controversy between the Pharisees and Jesus over this particular healing. John was there when Jesus showed up in Bethany. There he overheard the conversations Jesus had with Mary and Martha about the death of their brother Lazarus, who was a close friend to our Savior Jesus. He was there when Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb. He saw the tears coursing down Jesus' cheeks as our Savior wept. He was there when Jesus, facing the tomb, called out to Lazarus, Come out! Imagine, John was an eyewitness to the raising of Lazarus from the dead. John was there with palm branches in his hands when Jesus entered Jerusalem. And he also felt the hands of Jesus as the master washed his feet along with all the other disciples. He likely overheard the Jesus conversation at their last meal in the upper room, a conversation on the one hand with Judas Iscariot and a conversation on the other hand with Simon Peter. He heard Jesus pray on that occasion for all of his disciples and for all of those disciples who would come afterward, meaning all of us. This was Jesus' prayer, that they may all be one. He accompanied Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane and was there when Jesus was arrested John later heard from Simon Peter how that disciple denied ever knowing the man of Nazareth. 
John was there at the crucifixion and put his arms around Mary, the mother of Jesus, to comfort her in the midst of her sorrow. Undoubtedly, he was honored when Jesus from the cross asked him to look after his mother. And on what we call Easter morning, he was in the upper room when Mary Magdalene returned from Jesus' tomb, saying that Jesus was alive. While no one in the room knew how to respond to Mary's story, it was that evening when Jesus suddenly appeared to all the disciples. John himself, at that moment, experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit when Jesus, as the scriptures tell us, breathed on them. Sometime later, John was at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus appeared along the shoreline and told the fishermen where to cast their nets. And lo and behold, they hauled in a miraculous catch. He was there on the beach as Jesus prepared a charcoal breakfast for his disciples and overheard the conversation between Jesus and Simon Peter in which Peter was restored to full discipleship and leadership among the followers of Jesus. Yes, John was there. In the gospel John wrote and which bears his name, and in the three letters which he also wrote, he is telling you and me what his personal experiences with Jesus were. He is recounting first-hand conversations he had with Jesus and with others to which he was also present, even if he was not a part of that conversation. Now, friends, let me pause here and let me interject the impact that Jesus had another of his followers, namely the Apostle Paul. Paul uses three words to describe the impact that Jesus had on his life. These are the words that he uses. Faith, hope, and love. Say them out loud along with me. Faith, hope, and love. Now, in a similar vein, the Apostle John also writes about the impact that Jesus has had on his life. John uses two different words when he writes about this impact in the first chapter of his gospel. And the words he uses are these, grace and truth. Say them aloud along with me, grace and truth. Now, when John speaks about truth, he is referring, I believe, to two facets of that word. First, he is speaking of his personal experiences as real, as the truth. And he is also speaking about the kinds of spiritual understanding that Jesus has imparted to him and his heart and his mind. What Jesus has said is the truth, that is truth with a capital T. And one of the truths John has experienced through his relationship with Jesus is this, grace. John knows that he doesn't deserve to be loved the way Jesus loves him, but he is loved by Jesus anyway. He's saying to all of us, that he knows he's not perfect. He knows he's made mistakes. He knows that evil has beguiled him. He knows he's sinned. And because of these imperfections, he knows he doesn't deserve heaven's love. But John also knows this truth, that Jesus loves him anyway. Jesus loves John for who he is. And in spite of his shortcomings, in spite of his sins. And my friends, that's 
grace. It's grace when you receive love even though you believe you don't deserve it. And in today's brief scriptural selection from John's first letter, most probably written to those whom he knew and loved in the city of Ephesus, the disciple writes about purity. What he himself has observed in the presence of Jesus is someone who is absolutely pure. And he knows that he falls far short of the purity he sees in Jesus. And yet, John desires to grow more pure in his own life. This is what he hopes for. I assume that this is so because on the one hand, he wants to please Jesus. And on the other hand, there is something inside John which motivates him to want to be more and more like Jesus. And isn't that one of the goals of the Christian life? To be more and more like Jesus? It's kind of like when you've been working in the garden and when you're done, you, look, you take your gloves off and you look at your hands and even though you were wearing gloves, there's still dirt on your fingers and under your fingernails. And what you want to do is you want to wash up and get clean again. And the same kind of thing can happen in a person's life. Our shortcomings, our mistakes in life, our sins, dirty our souls. And we've become impure. We've allowed ourselves to become double-minded. We may say, to use an everyday example, that we love our partner. Ah, but there are so many other things in life that deflect us from giving our partner the love and attention they truly deserve from us. Let me apply the same principle to our spiritual lives. We may say we love God, yet there are many other things in our lives which we love as much as God, or perhaps even more so. And the law of Moses states it simply, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that, my friends, is a matter of purity. That's a matter of single-mindedness. A pure heart is one which loves God above all else and therefore has an undivided allegiance to God. In today's scripture text, the Apostle John writes, We know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies themselves, just as he is pure. Now, you've probably heard me speak previously about my friend Howard Storm. Howard had a near-death experience back in 1985. And when he died, he found himself in hell, where he was tortured by others, as he calls them, lost souls. In the midst of that torture, he recalled what he'd been taught as a little boy when he went to Sunday school. And he called out to Jesus. And Jesus descended into that darkness, healed Howard of the wounds he'd received there in hell, and then took him to heaven. There in heaven, Howard experienced a review of his life. He got to see in detail all of his shortcomings, all of his sins, all of the ways that he treated other people badly. But he was also forgiven of all of these things, cleansed, renewed. And while he would have preferred to remain in the heavenly realm, Howard was sent back to life here on earth. And so he worked from that time on 
to change himself. He worked to purify himself, to make himself more pure, more attuned to the person of Jesus. What Howard experienced is called grace. Now friends, many of us may make a judgment about ourselves that we're not worthy to be loved by God. But what the Apostle John experienced, what my friend Howard experienced, that is grace. And because Jesus loves us, Jesus extends that very same grace to you and to me, even though we may not deserve it. And that, my friends, that is the truth. Amen. Invite us to a time of prayer. Let us, uh, let us turn our hearts and our minds to God. Let us pray.
Oh God, we give you thanks as your people in this time and in this place for this time of worship, for this time when we can draw near to you and experience the presence of your spirit in our midst. And we thank you for the ministry of Jesus, both to us and to those events recorded in the, in the Gospels. We pray that our spirits might always be open to all that Jesus did and said, and so deepen our own spiritual lives. Guide us as we seek to be his disciples throughout our days, and may we seek to continue to purify ourselves, seeking the forgiveness that is offered to us by heaven, and so drawing ever closer and closer to the purity of Jesus. We uh, lift up in this time of prayer a number of people who stand in the need of prayer. And so we pray for Bill and Greta, for Karen, for Don, for Marilyn. We lift up prayers for Joyce and Jeff and Kylie and Dion. Oh God, you know what each and every one of these persons needs most. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will draw near to each and every one and that you will grant them the desires of their hearts. May they experience your healing presence in the midst of all that they are going through. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the ways in which you continue to guide and direct St. John's United Church of Christ. And we pray that all of us might be open to whatever it is that you have in mind for our future together. Guide and direct us that we might continue to be your faithful disciples in this time and in this place. We lift up prayers for the President of these United States of America and for the leaders of nations all around the globe. May your spirit guide them in the ways of peace with justice. And now, O oh God, in the silence of these moments, each one of us comes to you with our own thoughts and prayers and petitions. And now, O oh God, hear us as we lift to you the words to the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, when we reflect on the meaning of worship, we recall these two words, grace and truth. May God's truth inform your walk in this life, and may you live by the knowledge that God redeems us through heaven's grace. Amen. Amen.